everyone. Today I'm welcoming Aurélien Rigard. It's hard to pronounce your name in, in English. I don't know how you pronounce Aurélien in English. I think you're doing pretty well, Mathieu. Um, okay. Like pe people, yeah, definitely say Aurelian. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of okay. other nicknames, but uh, we'll stick with Aurelian for today. <laughs> Good. Aurelia is a co-founder and vice president of IT Consultants. IT Consultants is um, a web agency developing uh, website, apps, me programs, a very wide, uh, actually, um, a variety and spectrum of, of services. Um, you also introduce brands, uh, companies on Tmall, on marketplaces, as far as I understand, or you design the, the, the shop. That's why I understood from, 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 your, from your presentation online. And you have a team of 70 people with offices in China, Shanghai, Ho Chi Minh, Singapore. And uh, you are, I, I, I would be interested to know why those locations and how you manage them it would be very interesting to, to, to understand better. So you have founded the company in 2011, in March, more precisely, you are the co-founder with uh, two to three or total of four co-founders. I'm, I'm not totally sure of the number, and I, I, have, I will have questions on it. You yeah. had about four. You have worked on 450 products so far. Uh, a very a wide variety of clients as well, from the startup to uh, to big companies like Swatch, like Leica, and and many others. You are going to talk about if, if you are able to talk about what you did for them. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mathieu. Real pleasure to be here uh, in the morning. <laughs> yeah, we, we shoot early in the morning. Yeah, um, that's a good thing. First question, what about the size of the company? I, I read online, I read your presentation, it's a new presentation, a corporate presentation, 70 people more. Uh, very impressive. Um, yeah. To as, 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 <coughs> You are self-funded or you are not self-funded? Are you self-funded or you got funded? Yeah, we are 100% uh, self-funded. Yeah, we started the adventure um, seven years ago, uh, three three partners. So uh, we're a family company. So initially it was uh, um, my brother and I, uh, who get with, uh, with the family and and get the idea to uh, to kickstart this this company. And then like we uh, invited our third co-founder to, uh, to come and join us. So that was seven years ago. And now we have a team of 70 people. So 100% self-funded. We're not backed up by any banks, any fund, or any other agency. We're 100% independent. I see. Very impressive to, to grow from zero to 70 people. Um, so about the size of the company, you talk about 70 people. What about revenues? What about uh, number of projects, 450 number of clients? So, I mean, size of the company overall, like uh, roughly we are growing 40 to 50 percent year on year in the last couple of years. We are at the three million dollar plus company uh, and our goal is to continue uh, in the next year growing 50 percent. Uh, as you mentioned, being self-funded and growing 50% is uh, always a little bit of a challenge uh, sometimes for, you know, cash flow perspective, like all the companies being here in China established by foreign entrepreneurs. Uh, but uh, that's, that's the goal. So we have a lot of ambitions and we have ambitions to grow um, different regions, different services. Yeah, for listeners who are not managing businesses here or who, who don't touch the finance of the businesses in China, uh, it's very hard to get financing from any bank. You don't get a loan, you don't get working capital loan in China. So when you start a business, you need to, to get clients quickly uh, to, to, to pay your, your bills and you need to, to be resilient. And um, I'm, what I'm actually impressed by the size you've reached is that we see a lot of web agencies in China, there are many web agencies. I think, I, I feel the market is very competitive and I like to have your opinion on it. But you have few companies which reach the level of <coughs> 40 plus. Uh, they reach 30, but going to 40 plus, uh, you're becoming a very sizable agency in China. Um, what, what's your take on it? What, 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 what's your feedback on it? How did you grow to be <laughs> above average in terms of agency in China? Well, I think one of the secrets is uh, to always uh, remain grounded, uh, to always keep uh, your feet on the floor, and to always um, you know, build a company in order to scale it up. Always trying for your senior management to delegate as much as possible, a lot of mission uh, in order to keep, you know, that growth and keep this mentality. So it's, it's really like um, a matter of mentality if you want to scale a scale company. So, of course, it is, um, you know, an industry where there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of competition. 
And uh, I think if you want to keep growing, of course, you need to keep your best people. In order to get, keep your best people, you need their level of seniority to evolve You know, with, with the company. You need to make sure that they're going to delegate. You need to make sure that you're going to you know, be able to, to pay them more. And, you know, like this is the mentality, the scaling of that mentality that we've been, you know, applying to our team. So I think that's one of the one of our secrets to grow. And as well, like, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you need to be like extremely resilient. So, you know, like it's, you know, very hard work, very hard work, very hard work is like pushing your limits all the times. And, uh, you know, like I'm you know very happy as like an owner of the company is like the person, the manager I am right now. I'm a total different animal than I was like a year ago. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be like a total different one in a year from now. So it's, uh, it's, you know, constantly learning, learning and surrounding yourself with, you know, other entrepreneurs uh, or other business people that have been facing the same problems. And this is, this is the way I see, you know, scaling up. And this is why, you know, I'm very confident that, like we're going to scale up an extra 50% next year. I see. So it's about management for you. The scale is go- going through management. Yeah, I mean, management, uh, mindsets and effort, you know, like there's, you know, you, you need to, you need to manage everything. And, and since, you know, being in China, you need to be cash flow positive. You need to make like wise investments and you need to, you need to be healthy. Basically, you know, like if you want to grow like this, it means like you're a healthy company because there's a lot of companies, you know, that have like loans from banks here and there, and you never know if they're healthy. We need to be cash flow positive. Therefore, you, we need to be healthy. I see. You said you're a family company. Uh, is it rooted in, in, in France initially or you, you started uh, from China? I mean, is it linked with your, your parents, your grandparents or is it or it's family because you studied with your brother? Uh, it's family company because I started, started with the brother here. You know, he came here 10 years ago and he started a, a consultancy doing uh, sourcing and trading. And, uh, and then afterwards we came here, we started a, another project which uh, failed which was an e-commerce platform. And, uh, you know, after this failure, we decided to launch IT Consultants. And we are also owner of like two uh, Thai restaurants, actually three Thai restaurants in, uh, in Shanghai. <clears throat> and uh, so it's been like always, you know, like it's my brother and I, and now we have like two, two other, I mean, a third co-founder and another French uh, partner. So we have four, four partners. But, you know, like the mentality, the way, the way we, we work, the way we live is like, really like a big family. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, people are staying on the long run with us as well. Interesting. So it's a family mindset. It's not only because you, you, you studied with your brother. So you studied in 2011. And when I look at your background, you, you, you are not a programmer. You no. are, I, I, look at, I look at your background on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I will read it uh, uh, for the audience. Uh, structural engineer, structural design uh, for a five-star complex resort that was a product when you were a student. Uh, and uh, you worked, uh, you studied reinforced concrete structures, hydraulics, product management, steel construction, very far away from the digital industry. Yeah. How did you, how did you catch up this knowledge in, to, to, to be in the digital landscape in 2011 when, uh, that they just after your graduation, basically? So that's, that's like an interesting, you know, mindset. Like when you're young, you think that you're a little bit invincible. So my background is that I'm actually, as you mentioned, like a civil engineer. I graduated from like one of the top uh, engineer school in France, which is INSA. And uh, I did, so my first master's degree in France that I, I went to the US and I did a second master's degree. I was also a researcher. I did a lot of, uh, you know, amazing things over there. And then it was the, the recession. So I, in the US, so it was a little bit difficult to, um, to get a visa there in 2009, 2010. So I decided to uh, join my brother to come to China and, uh, you know, like to, uh, to become an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, at that time we were like, hey, you know, let's give it a try. And uh, there are opportunities. So um, one of, you know, like the, the way we have, um, we've been able to do it is like always surround ourselves with, you know, people that, that will have the knowledge. And I think, you know, coming back to, to your earlier question, why we've been able to scale the business up this well. You know, I've seen a lot of companies that started at exactly the same time as us. The only difference is that, you know, like the main person, the main driver of the company was usually a programmer. And this person was involving himself, you know, 100% in the project. So that means like creating like the value, but within the company. 
what we've been having is like really working on like in and out of the company. So structuring the company, I mean, working on like delivering the value, but also, you know, growing an ecosystem around it. So I think this is, you know, been very helpful. And afterwards, you know, why and why not? You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have been, you know, like starting different businesses where like they have like no background and no experience in that field. So I think, you know, like we are trained as engineers or as, you know, business people doing the schools that we're doing in France. Um, we are raised and the education that we have is structuring us to solve problems. So, you know, like when I, when I get into that industry and now seven, eight years ago, I saw this like as like uh, having like these challenges here and these challenges here and like this is the direction we want to take and like how we're going to assemble and how we're going to work with every everything. So, I see. so if tomorrow you tell me, hey, you're really, and you need to start a company in that in that ecosystem, you know, I will not be scared. You know, I will I, will, I would approach it in a very specific way. But still, recruiting a programmer requires tests, requires to know if you can really do it. Can you do it well? Can you do it <laughs> averagely? Can you do it poorly? Uh, yeah. How did you assess if you could be, you could do it poorly, averagely, or uh, uh, in an outstanding way? I, was it your first experience, uh, an e-commerce product that you learned, which uh, gave you the, the directions, the tools, uh, the ideas on how to assess so, the, the abilities of developers? I mean, for, first of all, like the key to for us to start the company was really recruiting our third co-founder, which was Tomagimo who is, uh, you know, still part of, of, of the company and is like one of the, one of the director. And he, more than my brother and I, is like m more geeky. Like he is like, uh, like even though he has graduated from a business school, like he has like a programmer and like a geek mindset. So having him on board, it was already, you know, like the opportunity to ensure that okay. this area of the business will be, will be 100% covered. Um, and then afterwards, it's like always recruiting the right person that you can trust. And <laughs> when we started at that time, you know, we started with less than $10,000. That's like one of the things that also you, you need to realize. So we had $10,000 and then we had like a couple of people to pay, including myself, including Thomas, including the first programmer that we hired, including the office. So, you know, like uh, being like remaining, you know, cash flow positive has been, you know, like uh, quite a challenge, especially, especially at the beginning. So that was like the major challenge. And, and then you need to bet on, you know, like people, because at the time we, we could not hire senior people. We definitely could not hire senior people. So he was like, for us, it's always been betting on like very smart, young uh, people that have like, that we know we can trust and that will grow step by step, you know, within like, the growth of the company that will help us grow the company. When did you join? Just at the start or? Uh, Thomas, yeah, like straight out of the start. So like, that, that was a funny story. So because like, we were doing this e-commerce platform and, you know, like we were like at a point where, you know, it was difficult for us like to maintain it and to continue it. And I talked to my intern at that time and like my brother and I, we shared this idea that we wanted to take to start a, a you know, a digital tech agency. And she came back to us and say, hey, guys, you know, like if you want to do this, I have like the perfect guy for you. Uh, you know, like you need, you need, you need to meet Thomas. I mean, he's in France right now, but uh, he's going to graduate, he's going to graduate soon. And the next thing you know, so I got him, I got him on the phone and I told him, Hey Thomas, you know, we want to do this. We have no money, but like what we have is like real like ambition. And we think that China is like a great market. And of course I was a little bit more convincing, but I don't know how, but like he say, Hey, yes. Like the next, the next day was like oh, two days later. He was taking a flight ticket. So yeah, that call, I was uh, pretty convincing, pretty proud of myself. <laughs> and so, you know, like that was the first break. So, you know, coming back to your question is like, how do you, how do you can, how do you influence people for them to, uh, in the end, like join the company, you know, like join your, your path and, uh, you know, like you have like a big hairy ambitious goal, like a BHAG, you know, how can you share it with other people and how, you know, they, they will follow you at some point. I think, you know, this is the biggest strength of, um, you know, like some entrepreneurs is, uh, you know, the ability for, for them to, you know, for, for people to join them on their path at some point. I see. Um, we're talking about uh, the big hairy ambition goal, goal, which is a wording used by EO. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, how how EO, um, I know you have involved in EO in, in China, in Shanghai. How EO has influenced uh, your way of management and change your way of management? Uh, and since when? 
<laughs> I think it was, uh, you know, like tremendously changed uh, my life in uh, in many ways. Um, first of all, like from, from a perspective. So, you know, like when I jo- when joined EO about two and a half years ago, we were just like reaching like the, the, the million dollar uh, revenue, um, annual revenue. And, you know, at that time, you know, I was thinking that, wow, you know, well, we're, we're a pretty decent company, you know, we're, we're doing well. And, you know, getting in an organization where, you know, there was like so many businesses that were like $500 million business. Like I was looking at them and like, wow, I, I have like a long way to go. So first of all, I was like thinking that, you know, where, wherever I was, like maybe I was thinking that it was like a decent size. Like I realized that, you know, it was a very small size. So, you know, from that moment, I decided, you know, <clears throat> I need to continue working very hard, you know, to, to grow to a sustainable side and like, you know, to be respected uh, in, the, in the community, in the entrepreneur community. So that's that's the first thing about EO, and then surrounding yourself with um, you know like-minded people, you know people that you can share, you know your your challenges, and you can brainstorm about like how you can improve your methodology, the way you manage things, the way you scale your business. Um, you know this has helped me, and this is like a great learning tool. And you know what I like to do is like you identify you have a couple of mentors in the organization, and you have a couple of mentees. And I like both aspects of it because I have a lot of accelerators or like a lot of other EO members that are coming to me and like asking me questions about how do I do this? How do I do that? And I do the same thing with, with other people. So I think it's a great, great learning community. And of course, as you, as you know, I, you know, I put a lot of time uh, into it. Uh, you know, I'm part of uh, the board of directors for uh, two, two years. I was an accelerator coach as well. And, uh, you know, I like it. I like it. Of course, it's, you know, can be time consuming and taking your time a little bit away from you, from your business or your personal life at some point. But, you know, I have to say that it's like, it's worthy doing it. So I highly recommend any entrepreneur like to get into the organization. Talking about your start, uh, what was your first client? What was your first product, first client? And how did you get it? All right. So first client was like a very small, I mean, very small. It's actually like not that small of a restaurant, a French restaurant called Le Salia. Uh, I, think, I think everybody in Shanghai knows it. <laughs> so the mindset that we adopted at that time was if we want to grow, we have no portfolio. We have no experience. <clears throat> we have no reason for people to trust us. That's it. You know, like we are, uh, you know, we, we're coming and like we have those companies that have like doing like 20, 30 projects. So the only way people are going to select us is that, first of all, we can, you know, like they, they feel that they they, have, they can have the trust in us. And, and of course, that we're going to be cheaper than the competition. So, you know, getting on the market, you know, our first project was a $500 project, which probably most of the company. Five hundred. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And like at that time, like we thought of, we were like crazy rich, you know, like it was like the beginning of like us like becoming super rich. And in the end, like there was like a 20 day project. So I'll let you calculate so what was the hourly rate we got paid for that, for that project. Huh? So it was, uh, yeah, we didn't make much money uh, on that one. So, you know, but the, the, the idea when, when we started the company, so, you know, you take those young entrepreneurs, they have like no experience. They don't, they don't have a portfolio. It's just like, yeah, they seem to be, you know, like nice and, uh, you know, like with a smile on their face and why, why, why should I choose them? So, you know, like you need to start, you need to show your motivation, you need to show your commitment and you need to show that whatever is going to happen, you're never going to quit on it. You're going to deliver what, whatever, whatever it takes, you're going to deliver and you're going to deliver with the highest level of quality you can expect at, at that particular time. So people decided to trust us, of course, like, you know, because we were in the entrepreneur community already for quite, quite a bit of time. And that's, you know, like we were showing that we will not quit. And, uh, and that, that was the beginning. And like this $500 project, what, what we did at that time is that even though, you know, like we could have get paid like two or $3,000 for, for the same job, we ensure at that time that this looked like a $2,000 project for one simple reason is that even if we know we are going to lose money on that project, but like when the company that had like $2,000 would come to see us, we will look, you know, good enough to take legitimate enough to take that $2,000 project. And once we get that $2,000 project, 
we made it look like a four thousand dollar project you know therefore when this four thousand dollar company will come then and you know this has been you know our approach since the beginning of course like you cannot do this for seven years now we are focusing more on profitability but you know like this is how you scale up from doing companies like small restaurants to fortune 500 companies because you know the sme you know like they were looking at us how oh, you can only do rest like website for restaurants and then yeah yeah, you show, you show, you show that you can do it, that you're aggressive, and then step by step you get here. And then like second stage you get here. And then, you know, we didn't start with a Fortune 500. We started like really at the bottom of the line. So very little cash, very little experience on the Chinese market. And then like step by step, you know, we worked very hard to get here, very hard to get here, very hard. And then, and then this is where we're going. The difficulty of managing an agency, and I, I uh, as far as I understand, with all the uh, all the people in um, in uh, in, the, in the agencies uh, they dream about having a product because a product makes 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 uh, the life much easier. It's retainer. It's paid. It's paid monthly or yearly. Uh, how how have you? Uh, what has been the service that has helped you to grow? Uh, how you manage the growth in agency where you need to adapt constantly mm -hmm. to the market, to the client, to the new technology? How will you manage this? I, I feel it's 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 rare that uh, it, it, you you can reach to a size of seventy people because of this, because it's hard to manage the growth. Yeah, um, uh, an agency. <clears throat> so first of all, um, you know, like talking about employee retention, you know, like because that that that's one of the first thing, as you say, a lot of people like love to go in startups where there's a product where they're gonna work, um, you know, something very specific. And you know, like I have to say that a couple of years ago it was really hard because like we were training, uh, you know, like really talented developers, and you know like they were very often attracted as well, like by you know like those kind of startups that raise you know very fast capital and you know like pay you know like the developers like a really you know crazy crazy amount of money and that's something that we could not compete with so i think like retention was you know like one of the key one of the key challenge and then for you know as as a company uh, you know we we tried a few times to say hey you know we're going to develop the product instead of um you know like doing only you know the agency work and <laughs> what we realize is that it is really not the same, the same word. It's really, really, really different. And, uh, you know, like we had, we had basically two, like two or three opportunities. What I products? Think, I think, you know, everybody has seen, uh, okay. So our first opportunity was, you know, like an HR system. We worked in the past for Zara, Inditex, Stella Luna, and a couple of like Decathlon as well. Um, you know, a specific product, which was like an O2O product where you can like, you know, scan a QR code. Uh, you know, like those those shops will leave, you know, little leaflets in the, in the shopping bag when people will leave. They'll scan a QR code and then like having the opportunity to apply online directly uh, for a job in the company. You know, you're just thinking about Zara, um, you know, like the client can as actually, you know, like be one of one of the staff, one of, one of the in-store staff. So at that time, you know, companies wanted to leverage their in-store traffic to convert them into potential employees because like for them recruitment was, you know, like those, you know, companies are growing like thousands and thousands of stores every year or more. So they were leveraging this. So like at that time, we got a lot of requests for, you know, similar product by, the, by different brands. So we're like, wow, you know, there's a great opportunity. And, you know, like the problem is that if you have an agency on one side and you're trying to develop a product on the other side, you always are going for the thing that makes you eat. So the thing that was making us eat, like was, you know, the, the money that our clients were giving us, you know, if you want to develop a product, that's a really different structure in terms of investment because you need to be exactly. competitive. You cannot charge a product like $10,000 to each, each of the clients because, if, if it is a product they want to pay like maybe like a, maybe a thousand dollar a month or like they want they want to be built on a retainer so at that time we didn't have you know like the structure or the capability or like maybe just like the, the, the mindset to make it happen so that was the first product and and then like really the second product is like a little bit like everybody has done at some point and you know some agencies have pivoted uh, to do this which is like the social CRM either chat chatbots or social CRM 
<laughs> so I know one agency that is, uh, I mean, like one social CRM that is doing extremely good. That was a, that was actually an agency in the past. And like, of course, we're, we're working with them and they have an awesome product, but at some point they couldn't continue do, doing, you know, like the agency and the product. So like that to say, Hey, we're only going in, in the product direction. There's one agency that is doing a little bit of both still, uh, which I think is very courageous uh, of them. And uh, so like, but for us, <clears throat> We, you know, like, I think that we, we understood that it would be, you know, like very difficult to be the best at it and that there was already like two or three, you know, excellent player on the market and to catch up with them, you know, we would have had to raise funds and we would have had like to really change the strategy. And when you want to grow a company, like what we're doing, like at 50% year on year, um, you need to put your full attention. You know, this is like a 70 hours a week work. And like, if you want to develop a product on the side, this is like probably the same mindset and the same amount of work. So, you know, like you only have one life and uh, you need to sleep at some point. So that's that's one of the reasons why, you know, we didn't go that way. But that's the thing. You are, you said at the beginning that you had all the businesses. You had Thai restaurants and, and you mentioned also all the businesses. So you are actually managing different businesses or you are in, involved in different businesses. <laughs> so we are, we are involved. So, uh, you know, my, like at the time, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like spending like maybe like 20 or 30% of my time on the restaurant business and then 70% on the, the, the agency. Now I'm like doing 99% on the agency or like 120 on the agency and maybe 1% on the restaurant. Uh, my brother is taking care of the restaurant business. So he is like spending like 50, 60% of his time on the agency and 40% on, on the restaurants. And, you know, it's as well, like, you know, like making a decision on like where, where you want to invest, invest your time. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is at, at the moment. Why, why, is, why did, you, did you suddenly open restaurants? Was it because you were not sure about, about your business and you wanted to diversify? Was it because you, you found an opportunity? Was it because you, 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 you had other partners to partner with? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really an opportunity. I, I, at that time, it was like five years ago. Um, you know, one of our friends was uh, actually selling uh, her Thai restaurants. And, uh, you know, like she wanted to do, she wanted to do something different at, at, a, at a restaurant. And uh, my brother and I, and like in the family, we've always dreamed about having a restaurant. So <clears throat> she came along with, uh, you know, like she was, you know, like seeing, seeking for investors, buyers. And uh, she told us, yeah, I'm willing to sell it for that price. And we're like, so we made a couple of calculation and we say, oh, all right, we'll do it. And, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, that was just based on an opportunity, you know, it could have been another business. Then like, we'd have say, Hey, you know, like, let's like, let's see this opportunity. Let's give it a try. So um, then we had the first one, then we opened a second one, which was a much, which is a much bigger one. <laughs> and now we have us as well launch, um, a little like kind of like corner, um, you know, fast food restaurant called urban tuk tuk. Uh, which is like something that is like using more like the, the new retail, you know, new technologies and like a lot of delivery shopping mall or co-working space. And, you know, this is like not like the big restaurant where, where you can sit down, like which is this is more like a delivery corner. And this is something that is much more scalable than like just a typical restaurant, which requires like tremendous investment if you want to start one location. I see. What's the name of the first restaurant? Urban Thai. So it's Thai, Thai food. So yeah, we, it's not French food. <laughs> okay, okay. Going back to IT consultants, so um, you 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 have developed first first website was basically um, uh, a website for restaurants, simple website. Now we are you are developing much more sophisticated uh, projects. What is the, the the main project you are asked to work for in China? Is it to go on Tmall and open a Tmall shop and design the Tmall shop? Is it to have an independent website? Is it HTML5? Is it mini program? What's new? What's trendy for 2018? Okay. So like just, just to correct on this, so we don't do uh, Tmall. Uh, I know it's like something that is written at some point on our, on our website, but that's something that we should have changed already years ago. So. We, we don't we don't do the Timo work. Um, you know we have excellent partners doing this. Um, so we do you know mainly things that will require like somebody working on the strategy. Then like we have UI UX designer. <clears throat> then we'll have like programmers uh, working on it. So 
I would say the big, so we have been working with, you know, brand like Swatch, Leica, Decathlon, Porsche, Budweiser. Um, you know, what, what is, what is strikes me in, uh, in 2018 is really the omni-channel approach is that, you know, like you're not doing a website just to do a website anymore. You're doing a website for, you know, to display your content, not only on, on the website, but you're like creating a content management system <coughs> to display the information in a mini program on the website in, you know, like the, the in-store, in-store display. So <coughs> now when brands are coming to see us, you know, like it's like, really an omni, omni, omni channel approach where you have like to target different users at different time, you know, like with, of course, like a piece of content that is going to be displayed in a very specific way for them. So, um, right now, one of the things that I'm the most proud of is like the ability for the IT consultants team to really take and tackle those, those program where, <laughs> you know, like right now we're working with a brand where, you know, like from, you know, like the concept to, to del delivery, we are helping them with, you know, selecting their ERP partners. We are helping them with selecting the CRM partners. Um, we are helping them with, you know, like digital touch points in the store. We are helping them to develop their e-commerce mini program, their websites, and, you know, linking everything with a, an order management system. So, you know, like that's how, you know, deep we, we are able to go from like, you know, doing this small website to having like, really like a strategy omni-channel approach where we're going to target, of course, everything is around WeChat nowadays. So you need to interface, interact, and, you know, make sure that it's going to be, you know, perfectly integrated within, you know, like the ecosystem, the dig Chinese digital ecosystem, or if we're doing project for Singapore or, you know, other region in Asia being integrated in that, in those systems as well. I see. So you're positioning yourself as um, the, the one-stop agency, which is going to partner with an ERP, which is going to set the ERP for the, 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 the end client. And you're going to organize all this work uh, because I guess you cannot I mean, take care of everything. Um, so w what are the different aspects uh, to look at when you talk about an omni-channel strategy? You talk about WeChat. And just clearly to be ready to to work on WeChat, it's linked to QR code, uh, linked to the ERP or the CRM of the company. What other aspects could, could should be looked at? Well, I mean, I think you you've already listed qu qu quite a few of them. I mean, depends afterwards if you're talking about an international brand or if you're talking about a brand that is that is localized. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenge with uh, data storing in, in China, privacy, there's always, you know, a little bit of like new regulation. So you need to pay a lot, a lot of attention, attention to this. Um, and afterwards, it's really helping, you know, like brands and customers or other entrepreneurs, um, you know, to make the best educated decisions. Um, you know, like our mindset is like that for the, the brands that we're serving is to bring them the best return on investment. So it's really, you know, helping them to make choices that are going to, you know, create like real revenue for them and that are going to be, first of all, scalable and that they're going to be able to keep using for, for, for the long run. That is going to be easy for them to maintain and where they're going to have like most, you know, freedom to interact with their, with their ecosystem. You are putting Ho Chi Minh, you are putting Singapore. Uh, as far as I understand, what she means for it would be partly for development. Yeah. Uh, it also for the market of Vietnam. And what about Singapore? How did you develop those three locations? <coughs> uh, do you have partners over there? Do, do you, did you send one of your partner over there, uh, one of the co-founders? How did you develop this? I feel opening a new location is always a very big challenge. Yeah, opening a location is always is yeah, it's it's always a challenge, and you know you always have more challenge that's, than what you expected earlier. So. Right now, so two years, a little bit more than two years ago, we, we made the decision to, to open Ho Chi Minh. So uh, main reason for this is that we always had uh, APAC ambitions. So not only China ambition. And at that time, uh, it was actually super duper hard. Like two or three years ago, there was like a crazy scarcity, you know, there in like to find, um, you know, tech, technical talents in Shanghai. And, and at that time we were, you know, debating where, whether like just opening like a, a production center in, uh, you know, like a little bit further than Shanghai. So we can be, 
you know, Hangzhou, it can be Suzhou, but it can be all the way up to Chongqing or to Chengdu. So, but like we, we were, we were not really sure, uh, you know, where to go, but like, we also knew that we had APAC ambition. So having APAC ambition, you know, like doing something in Suzhou, Hangzhou, when you want to target, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, or, or Japan, or Korea at some point, didn't really make sense. And uh, so we studied a little bit, uh, you know, like Asia Pacific. Uh, of course, we had to look at India because uh, India is very famous for its developer. We had to look at the Philippines and we, uh, you know, we had to look at, at Vietnam and uh, one of our good friends, they already had like a production center over there. And <clears throat> he was telling us only good things about it. Uh, so. Uh, we decided just to to go there for a trip and we kind of fell in love with, uh, you know, like the country and the city. And we started to interview people. <laughs> and then after 10 days over there, uh, we decided to open the company. So that was like interesting. So <clears throat> my brother and I went there. Then, you know, Thomas went there. Like we stayed there like one week. Thomas went there one week. And after those two weeks, like we met with a lawyer and like, we, we started the company straight away. So <clears throat> I think that was, uh, that was a wise choice. Um, afterwards, as you, as you mentioned, like opening a company and having like two location is something that is of course very challenging. And what we thought that, you know, like we just clap and, you know, the company will open and everything will be easy and, you know, like teams will work together very easily. No, <clears throat> that's not as easy as it looks because like whenever like you're working like on two sites, you know, that the easy communication that's, you know, like when you have a problem you, or like when you have like a task to do, you just can go to the person and say, hey, you know, like whatever I wrote on that ticket, you know, I was expecting it to be like this and not like this. Now you have, you know, people, of course, like it's almost the same time. So there's only one, one hour time difference. But that means like you need to document much better what you're doing. And then, you know, at the same time, you know, like it's, we're talking about different culture, different language. So it's, you know, like creating like other barriers and, you know, unanticipated uh, ways to, to, to work. And then like in the end, it's kind of forced us to become more and more professional. So in, in a way, you know, like that was not expected, but I have to say that this would add some work in terms of quality control and in terms of project management. So if before you would spend like 20% of project management of quality control on the project, <laughs> then all of a sudden you will need to spend, you know, like five or 10% more on, on, the, on the same project because you need to add communication. You know, you need to add documentation. Yeah. So yeah. that was one of the things. But, <clears throat> you know, for us, like we always work, so we have the two teams and like right now, like most, most of the work that we're doing is actually targeting, you know, China. So for most of the project, we still have like 50%, 50%. We always have, you know, like the same amount of people working here in China, which are Chinese developers most of the time working on a project along, uh, you know, like developers from Vietnam. How big is the team in Vietnam? So right now we have uh, 40 people in Shanghai. We have a little bit less than 30 in, uh, in Vietnam. And we have two people in Singapore. <clears throat> what was your first hire in Vietnam? You, you had a ma manager? Yeah, uh, first hire was uh, a lady called Nin. Uh, she's our HR and admin manager over there. So that was like that was my first hire. I spent like eight hours um, at uh, you know like in the Sofitel uh, in the meeting room of, of the Sofitel. The one of the first. I mean, the first time I went there because like we already like pre-screen a lot of CV. And I, uh, you know, met people back to back. And, uh, you know, af after this, it was clear that uh, we were going to hire her. And then like a couple of days later, she was, she was uh, starting with us. So that was, uh, you know, like <clears throat> starting and like straight away launching, launching something. And for uh, Singapore, Singapore was a, a different story. So Adrian, uh, who is our uh, BD, who was our BD manager in Shanghai, um, his uh, girlfriend, um, who was like a, a very important position uh, within a pharmaceutical organization, uh, was, you know, like moved to Singapore as like a director for APAC region. And, uh, you know, like for Adrian, it was, you know, a little bit hard to, to, to stay here. And, uh, you know, he told us, hey guys, like, uh, I, I love the company and, you know, like definitely see that there could be, you know, potential opportunity in Singapore. 
So I think that would be great if I go there and I open the office. And, you know, like, I think the decision was made, like, same thing in just a couple of hours, say, hey, you know, let's give it a try and let's see how it works. Huh? I see. You are developing from uh, partly from Vietnam. I understand yeah. that it's not only from Vietnam. Um, we know that China is 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 very specific in terms of uh, digital development programming. Uh, there is China and the rest of the world, basically, as uh, Facebook and on Facebook, the Google and on Google. Um, how do you? What what would you suggest any client to do in order to localize uh, localize in China their digital presence? What are the best practices? Um, to 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 um, to follow in China. Uh, do, do you have a list in mind to look at when you look at the website when you look at the at the situation of a company of what they will have to adapt? <laughs> All right. So I used to manage most of the of the design and the design localization when the company was a, a little bit smaller. I mean, like not doing it the design myself, but uh, interacting a lot with our with our design team to to work on this. So, but it's been quite. Quite a long time, so I don't think I have like the best still up to date list uh, when when it, when it comes to this. But overall, of course, like user experience, so you have to look at different things. You need to first look at it from you know like a programming perspective because, as you know, there's a great firewall in China. So you know, like the way you're working globally with you know a CDN, like a specific script, specific functionality, um, this doesn't apply in China. Uh, because we, we're going to come back to it, but like there's like the programming part in terms of localization. That's the first thing. And the second part is the user experience. So user experience, we're going to, we're going to start by this. Of course, each and every single country has like their own specific ways to, you know, like to have their own user experience, their own user interface. But I think China is at another, another level. Um, you know, like everybody knows about the Chinese great firewall and that the fact that the ecosystem is very different here. So having a different ecosystem means like that Chinese users have been used to really use different apps such as, you know, WeChat, Alipay. And it has changed as well the way that users are, um, you know, like, sorry, experienced creator are working, you know, within the system. So a lot of people now will open a website or an e-commerce platform within WeChat. So they will have to use all the social logging aspect. They will have to use maybe the coupon of WeChat or like they will need to create like a mini program instead of like just, you know, like doing an application. <laughs> so localization on that on that part is very crucial. The Chinese users, they have like a different mindset. They have a different way to interact with a digital screen, with the digital world. And, and I think this is something that needs to be taken into consideration. You know, for example, like when you're doing shopping on Amazon on an app or in, you know, like in France or in the US, <clears throat> the user experience is going to be very different than the user experience you're going to have on Tmall or you're going to have on JD. So, <clears throat> you know, like when you're building something for e an e-commerce perspective, you need to think about this and how, you know, like the users are going to interact with, with your experience. So that's the first thing. And uh, there is a good list of like five, 10, 20 things that needs to, um, you know, like that you, you need to check upon. But the most important thing is like, you know, like the mindset and inspira in, you know, getting the inspiration from, from those experiences in order to make sure that the learning curve of the users coming on the experiences that you have created is going to be the, the smallest possible. So that's the first thing, <clears throat> the user experience. The second thing that you really have is like from like a technology perspective, and I think that's, you know, one, one of the reason why as well, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, like massive players coming to China uh, and like that we are competing with, you know, <clears throat> not a lot of agency will have like this knowledge about how to do digital in China. So you have the great firewall. So that means like you need to host your website in China most of, not most of the time, but all the time. So you need to, to have, you know, like your content delivery network in China. Uh, you need to have, you know, everything registered in China. So that's, that's one of the big challenge and you need to use all the ecosystems. So including all the APIs of Alipay, of WeChat Pay, you know, like starting up your, your mini program or like interconnecting with your order management system, your CRM system, and of course, everything needs to be stored in data or anonymized, like if it's sent outside of China. 
So those are the other things to consider because, you know, a company that will go to, you know, like Vietnam or Indonesia or like a French company that will try to do (laughs) e-commerce in Germany, like things will be, you know, quite easy. Maybe like the only thing that you'll need to change is, is the language. But, you know, like the infrastructure is easy. Like if you have a website that is like hosted in France, it's easy to do it in Germany. In China, like it's brought at a much different level. So like the localization is a real challenge for every brand. And then I would say one of the biggest challenges as well is that, you know, a lot of, you know, like the global solution, uh, such as, you know, Salesforce Commerce, Oracle Commerce are not yet authorized in China. Mm. So that means like... Salesforce server in Hong Kong, right? Yeah, the servers but, of Salesforce in Hong Kong. <laughs> so there's still a lot of companies using Salesforce, uh, you know, like that will probably uh, re- require like a lawyer to discuss more like about the new regulation and so on. But like if we just talk about Salesforce Commerce, which is the e-commerce platform, uh, then this is like a solution that do not have that as center. So if you want to use it first, like in terms of legal aspect, it's a little bit shaky. And the second thing is that it's not in China. So like the time that you will have in order to just do a transaction or add something to your checkout is going to take, you know, like maybe like one, two, sometimes three seconds. So therefore it's going to kill your user experience. So those uh, solutions are not in China. So there's a lot of companies that are using those, you know, big solutions globally and they come to China and they cannot use it. So they need to use another solution such as, you know, like Magento or, you know, another order management system Or, you know, they might use Adobe, you know, content management system globally or Sitecore, and then they come to China and they need to use something different. I see. Uh, You were talking about UX. Uh, Do you use the Scrum methodology to adapt to every every iteration? Yeah, I mean, you know, Scrum, Agile, uh, it's uh, it's always a, a little bit of of challenge to uh, because like Scrum, doing Scrum in an agency is, is always a little bit of, of a challenge. Uh, but why do you think it's challenging? Because we are, um, you know, our workload really depends on our clients feedback sometimes, you know, like when you're like working on a product, it's very easy to know that you're going to do this and then you're going to do that. And then you're going to do that. Working with a client sometimes is you're expecting feedback. So let's say you start on a design, you do your wireframe and then all of a sudden you're stuck for one week because you're waiting for feedback. And like at that time, you know, you need to work on another project. So (laughs) let's say that you need to, you know, very often realign what are the priorities and how, like, of course you need to make sure that you don't do context changes too often. But that, that's, of course, you know, like the, how, how are you going to optimize, you know, like the, the resource management within, uh, within the company. So, of course, we're using it, but, you know, we're adopting uh, in the best way possible. So when you, when you work with, um, with a client, do you say you, we have two, three iterations? How do you, how do you communicate on that? So that's, that's always, always a challenge <laughs> because a number of iteration is... Um, it's always great to define a framework. Uh, but what I love and what I love, you know, like the mindset of our people is to be like, you know, until it's going to be perfect, uh, then like we, we're going to make it happen. So of course, usually what we see is that usually will take three or four <laughs> iteration, depending on like what's, you know, like what area you're looking at. So for example, like if you're like talking about wireframe, if you're doing like UX part, then, you know, like two or three iteration will be, you know, necessary. Uh, but afterwards, when you're doing the homepage as well, when you're working on the user interface uh, of the homepage, sometimes like two, three, even four iterations might be needed. But, you know, you cannot start working on the rest of the project if a client is not happy with his homepage. So, you know, like for us, it's, you know, like you need to frame it legally, but overall, I have to say that until we find something that is, you know, perfect from our standard and that is going to appeal to the clients, um, you know, like we're going to make it happen. Last question. We could continue, I guess, for hours, a lot of topics, uh, interesting topics. The last question is about the future. We talk about AI, we talk about VR, we talk about AR, we talk about voice recognition. <laughs> uh, my, my question is two questions. First, is it happening, VR, AR, 
AI Boss Commission? And secondly, how do you stay up to date? How do you know it's time to develop the competencies and talents in, internally in order to be able to answer to the to the to the, the request of the clients? So, you know, like we have uh, we have we have a team of like senior manager that are uh, you know what, what I like a lot about our team is that we are not you know like specialized into a solution you know like we're not here <clears throat> we our teams are like real engineers so if they need to be on top of the trend all the time you know they will be on top of the trend so let's say like there's a new version of uh, you know, like a Drupal or a solution that comes out, so we will be very early adopter. Why? Is because like the people that we have, like they have the mindset to learn and learn and learn to be engineers, to be you know tech oriented. <clears throat> so that's the first thing, and I think that's you know like important to have like a team of problem solvers. The second thing is that <clears throat> the way we manage the company, actually, we rearranged a little bit internally the processes and like how team will work together. Um, and, you know, like I really think that we like the new organization that we have, like we have like what we call like squads now. So different leaders, uh, different people are going to operate their own like small team within the company. And this is going to enable us to first of all, become excellent in each of those fields because we're going to be a little bit more specialized. <laughs> and I have the feeling that if tomorrow we need to kickstart, you know, other projects, uh, you know, like doing maybe, you know, like voice UX or, um, you know, like doing maybe UX or, you know, work for cars uh, in the future or, um, you know, like doing a little bit of AI or doing something different, um, we're going to be able to do it. So our our scope of work, you know, as mentioned earlier, we went from like doing website for a small restaurant to do <clears throat> really like an omni-channel approach. So I can see that we're going to grow. We're going to keep growing, but within our scope, within our competencies. So right now, for instance, like we don't do content creation and I don't think we're going to go there. So we do a little bit of CRM, social CRM, which is something which is strategy related for, for the things that we're doing when we're building an omni-channel approach. Um, but yeah, I would say that's, that's really a step by step. And yes, we, we, we see it happening. We see, you know, like the systems that we are building are, you know, like all of them are communicating together from, you know, like a ticketing system to an order management system. <clears throat> and the fact that, you know, like with a new technology, everything is becoming headless. You can have like a user interface that is going to pull content from, you know, the e-commerce OMS platform to the logistic platform here to the content management system. And then you can pull all the information here on an app or like a mini program or like, a, you know, an in-store a digital experience. So I think <clears throat> this is where, you know, like the technology is like, you know, like really moving forward and, and, the, and it's just becoming like so interesting uh, and you know, like the future with, uh, you know, self-driven car is going to be like another breakthrough with, of course, voice, uh, you know, like with all the, the, the voice appliances that uh, we're going to have with uh, Alexa and all the Chinese competition that is arriving strong on the market. But you, you're you going to be in a, in a digital world where you, you're you going to be able to order or to interact with the screen almost anywhere. And and I think this is uh, this is like where, where we're going to focus our future. Thanks for your time, Aurelien. Uh, how did you how did you like the interview? Well, so I have to say that it was the first time uh, for me. So I got a little bit of a cold in the last weeks, and uh, it was a little bit uh, early in the morning, but I loved it. So thank you. I think you're a great host, Mathieu. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for joining. It was very instructive. Um, we will publish in a week.